We're we'll starting in like five, about five minutes. We just uh, want uh, everyone uh, to uh, to log on. Um, does anyone want to say anything beforehand? You're welcome to, to say hi. Vinu Malkenu, Shima Koilenu, Shima Koilenu, Khus Virachim, Virachim Alenu, Virachim. 
Yeah. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this wonderful evening. Um, can everyone hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? Yeah. Okay, excellent, beautiful. Thank you all for joining us um, for this wonderful evening and um, we look forward to having a beautiful, inspiring Zoom um, virtual lecture event tonight with uh, Dr. Bernard, Bernard, I'm, I'm uh, oh, one second, sorry. I'm just unmuting everyone, okay. Um, with uh, Dr. Bernard Walschlanger, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your, your name right. Um, excuse me if, I, if I'm not. Um, my name is Rabbi Moishi Karlebach, and um, I'm with Chabad of Toluca Lake. We have a privilege and honor to have two communities joining us tonight. My, our community from Toluca Lake, together with my dear brother, Rabbi Zalman Karlebach from Chabad of downtown San Diego, with his community. Beautiful to be here. And um, we are going to, um, tonight, I found it a very um, important night and beautiful night right before um, a few weeks, two, two, three weeks before Rosh Hashanah to have this event. Um, we advertise it as a pre-high holiday lecture. Um, and the reason being is that uh, we've had a few uh, lectures about journeys of people and truly they've been inspiring to see how people have transformed themselves, have changed themselves. Rosh Hashanah is a time where we begin a new year. And um, it's a time to focus introspective. Um, now is a time where we prepare our days to go into the new year, the Elul, and to think about ourselves, Elul, and think about changes that we want to make in our lives. Generally, it can happen that Rosh Hashanah just uh, follows the motions and another uh, New Year comes, another Rosh Hashanah, and we just follow the motions. But I'm sure for many of us, COVID has brought about um, a lot of thought and, um, into ourselves and how this Rosh Hashanah, it can't just be like a regular Rosh Hashanah. It's going to be a different Rosh Hashanah. And um, therefore, hopefully, that this Rosh Hashanah will definitely bring about change and change for good, change in us and change, um, uh, and change, please God, in the whole world. And what better way to prepare ourselves for that than to have a person whose life journey um, was one that he necessitated to have change in his life. And a life journey that showed that we're not defined by our, our past, that one can make changes in one life. And I don't think you can get worse than of having a past uh, history of a uh, father being a Nazi. So we're really looking forward um, to that, um, to hearing this um, beautiful presentation. Um, the way we're going to work is before I uh, present uh, my esteemed brother, Rabbi Zalman, to, to make an introduction, uh, which will then follow by, he'll introduce Dr. Uh, Bernard, and um, following that, we will have, we'll open it up to um, the presentation to a question and answer, like we've done in previous Zooms, where you can uh, send it through the chat. I know some questions have already uh, been asked and we my brother and myself will moderate the questions and then following that we'll have another beautiful presentation So I'd like to uh, qualify my brother to uh, say a few words and introduce our speaker tonight Thank you and welcome to all our Visitors zoom and on the various different uh, um, outlets um, over there, I think we have over a uh, hundred people already joining us and it's wonderful to see you all on the screen and on Zoom 
uh, just before the sun sets, we have a custom in the month of Elul, that Elul is the time that uh, the, we sound the alarm. We kind of change our actions. We want to all be uh, vibrant and strong and good. And, 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 and after reflecting on the past, work towards a better future. So we say the king is in the field. God is actually coming out and experiencing us in the field, and we can reach out to Hashem. So therefore, just as a uh, symbol of the alarm and the topic of tonight's lesson uh, and, and inspiration of hearing such a, a wonderful life story from uh, Dr. Walschlanger, I'm going to start off with sounding the alarm and uh, blowing the shofar. So if you'd like to stand up, you're welcome to. Otherwise, since it's just through the waves of Zoom, it's not really counted, but it's just the awareness that we're trying to put that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the high holidays are coming. We will be gathering either in Shul or in our whole new year. So I'll sound the shofar. <laughs> As you hear the sound of the shofar, which is a verberance of the sound, it actually also doesn't just speak to our physical ears, but to our neshamas, to our soul. And that's what we gather tonight, is to hear this wonderful story of inspiration from uh, Dr. Bernd Walschlanger, a doctor in Florida who was born to... Uh, German parents, not of the Jewish faith, and actually a highly decorated uh, soldier, uh, part of the, the Nazi regime. And uh, Dr. Bernd decided that uh, this is not for him. I'll leave it up to you to share your story, Dr. Walschlanger. Thank you for joining us. Let me just unmute you. Are you, uh, one second. Sorry. Why is it not on YouTube? Can you? Can you hear me? Ah, now we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rabbi, for inviting me. And uh, I'm just rolling on, or do you need? Okay, here. What? Can as a but at least we can use the Zoom capability to talk to each other. Well. And it's our life, which is obviously like anybody's life, very personal. But I decided to do so not because I came to the conclusion that it's important, but my, because of my son and my children, specifically my son first, asked me a very simple question. He was about 15. He's now 31. And uh, he asked me a simple question, Dad, who is my grandfather? Now, for you, it wouldn't be a problem to tell your children who the grandfather was or is. But for me, it was a problem because, first of all, I never talked about it. And secondly, I needed to start to reconcile two worlds that are hard to reconcile. On the one hand, I am, yours truly, I am Jewish. I'm an Israeli citizen and served in an Israeli combat unit uh, for two years. On the other hand, my father, my son's grandfather, was a highly decorated World War II German tank commander and convinced National Socialist. 
So how do you reconcile these two worlds, these very different worlds? That's my story. So it all began, of course, with the time and place I was born in and born at. I was born May the 9th, 1958, in a gorgeous city called Bamberg. I'm not uh, blowing the horn for the German tourism industry, uh, but Bamberg is a town in the north of Bavaria, nestled between Nuremberg and Würzburg, a picturesque town a thousand years old and never touched by any war. And the sense of history was all over the place. It's called the Rome of the North, uh, this cathedral in, in, in crowns the major hill and a, a mountain in Bamberg. And um, we as children were drilled to understand the importance of history, a thousand years forward. So we could name churches, princes, queens, what, what, where, what pope was buried, that a pope was buried in the cathedral. So we all knew that. But one thing, we didn't talk about it, was this time between 1933 and 1945. That was taboo. Now, as a child, I didn't ask the question because I didn't understand it anyway. But I found it strange that we living in a town, uh, and there was a war that we knew, and that the foreign soldiers stationed in the town made me to believe uh, that if so foreign soldiers, Americans actually, 10,000 American soldiers, staying in a town of 75,000, the Bamberg population, that uh, we obviously didn't win that war. Then I figured out, but no, nothing else. And I was curious to know more about it because the more our teachers were stayed silent and nobody wanted to say a word, I asked my parents, who actually didn't want to talk it either. So my simple question about my grandfather and my grandmother, maternally and paternally, was I got the answer, they're gone because of the war. So the war was there, nobody wanted to talk about it. Tremendous impact on families, on, on, on the country, and nobody wanted to inform me. But slowly but surely, because I was, well, I'm a nerd, I mean, I was asking all the time, and my parents eventually had to had no other choice but to tell me what was going on. And then I heard two different stories, one for my father and one for my mother. My father was an outdoor person, a hunter, taught me how to handle a rifle, how to fish. We had a very close relationship. And on long walks on Sunday afternoons in the forest, he told me his part of the story over and over. That he was the youngest German tank commander serving under the command of General Guderian, the father of the German Blitzkrieg, and my father belonged to his elite unit. And every battlefront that Germany opened from September the 1st, 1939, the attack on Poland, my father's tanks were the first rolled in. Following year, the attack on France, Holland, Belgium, my father's tanks were the first to roll in. And then of course, in the summer of 1941, the Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the former Soviet Union, my father's was not only the first tanks rolling in or commanded the first tanks rolling in, his unit came the closest to Moscow, just a few hundred kilometers away. And during that time, an essential push towards Moscow, he, my father's unit overran a town called Orel. And for that accomplishment, he was awarded the Knight's Cross by a man he still adoringly referred to as his Führer, Adolf Hitler. Now, I had no idea what Führer was, no idea what Hitler was. But the fact that my father was called by his old buddies who came to visit our house at least once a year to celebrate the good old times, they referred to my father, Arturo, our hero, and they told me, you have to be proud of your father. And so I was proud of my father, but what else did I know? On the other hand, my mother didn't tell me the story of glory. She told me the story of horror. She was an ethnic German, a Sudeten German, born and raised in Czechoslovakia on the border along Czechoslovakia and uh, West Germany. It was an area called the Sudetenland, populated by two, approximately two million uh, Germans for several hundred years. And as a result of the war, Everybody had to flee. One million were killed. And my mother just barely escaped her hometown, Kalsbad, where her father had a beautiful villa, or could afford a beautiful villa on the outskirts of Kalsbad, and everything lost. The flourishing merchant business, the villa, just with a gun in her hand, a revolver, she pushed through the border and fled like all the other hundreds of thousands of Germans, ethnic Germans, towards the West. So for her, it was catastrophe. For my father, it was glory. But there was something else that they didn't tell me, but something that I felt. For example, my mother told me to a dentist, I love dentists, uh, must be a masochistic uh, part of me, but I think I love to go to the dentist because I could go out of the house with her and see other places. And the dentist was located in, a in this building in downtown Bamberg. And uh, 
in the when you walked to the door, the ground floor door, and you walked up the floor, the steps, you saw a glass storm out of beautiful inlays of pictured colorful glass, and above that glass door a star, a golden star. Now I was growing up in a town that was 99.9% .9 Catholic, with crosses all over the place. When there's a golden star, and I never have seen that before, of course I wanted to know what it is. And I remember my mother squeezing my hand, pushing me up, pulling me upstairs to the dentist, hissing into my ear, don't ask me this question again. That star was actually the Dan Magen David, and this glass door behind was the old Jewish community of Bamberg. And I would come back to that place with a completely different attitude. And there was something, also something else where the house that we were living in was a massive two-story building, patrician style, still standing. We rented an apartment downstairs with another family and above the, the landlord lived in a beautiful, large, well, probably half of a basketball field apartment. And my mother told me she's a noble woman. Don't ask her any questions unless you've spoken to. And in the midst of the hallway, there was a flight of stairs and you saw then a picture, a portrait of a man hanging on the wall, obviously belonging to the countess and depicting a man, an officer like my father, whose pictures I saw or photographs I saw at home in uniform in uniform with the officer's insignia on the shoulder, the, the officer's cap, and the knight's cross around his neck. And I asked my father, who is this man, or who was this man? And my father hissed at me, he was a traitor. Now that's for a child like me, wait a second. Two people look alike, my father in uniform, who is good, and this man in uniform, who is bad. What is the, what's the story? And later I learned from the lady upstairs that this was the portrait of her late husband, Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the German colonel who was leading the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944, which unfortunately failed. He was executed the same night. And Nina von Stauffenberg, his widow, was deported to a concentration camp in Ravensbrück and survived. Her two children were giving up for adoption and then were transported to Buchenwald for final treatment. And uh, several officers in Buchenwald rescued them too. And they were reunited after the war and she lived upstairs. So something was strange, something was not right. And then came an event, then we started to talk slowly but surely in school about the part of history that was not touched much. And it, what we learned was kind of a horse manure story. I thought it's a PG rated event, so I don't wanna use the word that I would like to use. And that was the following. The Nazis rose to power in 1933, in January 1933, after democratic election. Hitler was appointed by Papen and the, the, the prime minister and the president of Germany, Hindenburg, he established a brutal dictatorship. And within six months, everything was this terror, was terror and Stalinistic like terror and dictatorship. And concentration camps brought it up throughout the country like mushrooms. And all those who didn't agree were locked up in a concentration camp. Hitler started the second world war, six million, seven million, eight million people died. Among them, excuse me, 60, 70 million people died. Among them, six million Jews as collateral damage of war. And then on the 8th of May, Germany surrendered. And huff and puff, the Nazis were gone like the Huns invaded and, and then walked, moved on. That was, of course, not the right story. This was just a cover up. And then came an event in Germany that changed everything, everything. The Olympics in 1972 in Munich. For the first time, West Germany, the democratic Germany, East Germany was a communist Germany. West Germany was awarded to host the Olympics. And the, what a discrepancy. 1936, Adolf Hitler abused the Olympics to propaganda purposes. And here, West Germany, under the leadership of, a, of an almost revolutionary new prime minister, his name was Willy Brandt, who was the first post-war German politician who escaped, in, who was a socialist, an of, opponent of the Nazis, escaped Germany in 1933 and returned to Germany in 1949 to recover and to regain his citizenship. He rebuilt the Social Democratic Party, as it was called, and rose to power in 1969 in a landslide election. And his first act as a prime minister was to travel to Poland in December 1970. And in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial, he sank on his knees, bowed his head, and asked for forgiveness in silent prayer. Never happened before. And the picture of the chancellor kneeling in front of a memorial went around the world. And in every newspaper, including ours, 
regional newspaper, it was on the front page. And I remember my father yelling and screaming in German, wieder ein Verräter, again a traitor. Now, I was confused. A man who was kneeling in front of a memorial, that's something positive. I was an Orthodox Catholic, at least raised by my mother, who was an Orthodox Catholic. My father was a Protestant. And I went to Catholic kindergarten, Catholic elementary school, I was an altar boy. My mother wanted me to become a priest. That didn't work out, obviously. And um, for me, kneeling in front of memorial was positive. Why my father is so mad? And this chance of it, the tremendous moral standing in the Western world, opened the Olympics to a great fanfare. And I remember, because we had our first TV, black and white glow, and my parents invited friends over, find food, wine, beer, hello, hooray, and everybody watched the teams parading to the stadium this hot August day in 1972. And suddenly a team appeared on the screen carrying a flag with that star that I had saw in the dentist office, next to the dentist's office, where my mother had this funny reaction. And in that moment, everybody was quiet. It was the do not ask the question moment. And I asked myself, what? That is weird. Why do the adults behave like that? That is another team that paraded to the stadium. I had no clue, no idea what that meant. And then 10 days later, the catastrophe happened. The same team that so proudly paraded into the stadium was brutally attacked by a group of Palestinian terrorists, elite unit of the PLO, the PFLFP, and um, took butcher two Israelis in Olympic Village. We know now actually that they were guided with weapons, money, and logistics by the East German sec security service called the Stasi. And uh, they took the remainder of the Israeli citizen, athletes and citizens as uh, hostages. And the leader of the gang, Issa, he negotiated with the prime minister, with the, actually with the minister of interior of Germany face to face, who begged them, begged him, him specifically, to offer themselves cabinet members of the German government as hostages in lieu of the Israelis. The shame was too great to, to allow more Israelis and Jews to be killed in Germany. And uh, Issa, de, Issa denied, he wanted to be flown out with his entire crew and the hostages to a military airport outside München called Fürstenfeldbruck. And then a German Boeing 707 of the German Army Air Force should fly them out to an Arab country of their choice. And then exchange should take place between, I think it was 300 or 400 prisoners in Israeli prisons, Arab prisoners for the hostages. And that played out beat by beat. I remember it as it was yesterday. Two helicopters took off in the nighttime from the Olympic Village, another helicopter behind with security services, flying into the low formation to the first and third Brook military airport. And then behind the closed gates, nobody could see what happened. All hell broke loose. Firefight explosions, night, times, night sky lit by explosions, massive explosions. And the firefight, the firefight lasted at least two hours and then deafening silence. And afterwards, an American journalist, exhausted, face, facial expression, turned towards the camera and said something very simple and horrible. They're all gone. What happened, the German police wanted to liberate the hostages. The Israeli Mossad unit, specifically Mossad Kidon unit, um, it tried to impress upon the German authorities, we need to deal with that, these are elite soldiers. The Germans wanted to do themselves. And when they opened fire, Issa immediately recognized that they were trapped, threw a hand grenade in one helicopter before it was shot dead, which exploded. All Israelis perished in a fireball. And the next helicopter he shot with another terrorist, shot with at least 30 to 100 rounds of machine gun fire, killed everybody. And the next day, that picture that went around the world on the front page of every newspaper had changed my life. Two helicopters on the tarmac, one burned out with the charred remains of the Israelis inside. The other helicopters with the bodies of the Israelis slumped over the seats, barely covered with blood-stained white linen. In a huge headline, Jews killed in Germany again. I speak perfect German. I spoke perfect German then too. But what does it mean again? There must be some connection to the past. I have no idea. And when I came home that evening, I asked my father in school, we you heard about this terrible attack. Um, can you tell me something about it? My father was yelling and screaming, again, those Jews, them, again, them. They stain our national image. They destroy our country. They draw always us into the mud. Them, the Jews. He was angry about the victims, not about the perpetrators. And the next following weeks in school, we talked for the first time. I was 14 years old 
about what it meant to be a German. That it was not an accident of history, not collateral damage, what we heard in school about the war. It was a systematic murder in the name of Germany, a democratic elected government, systematic murder of six million Jews. I heard for the first time Auschwitz, Birkenau, Majdanek, Final Solution, Eichmann, Mengele. I was shocked. I was totally shocked. More And also, I had this nagging feeling that, that something is wrong with my father. He was the hero. He was in those areas. Hopefully he didn't do that, but maybe he can tell me. So I asked him. And as you can imagine, he was not very verbal. But I asked him, said, Father, in the school we learn about the Holocaust. What do you know about it? His answer was, Bernd, the Holocaust is a lie. It never happened. Your teachers are communists. Listen to me. So I was caught between the rock and the hard place. On the one hand, my father, whom I respected and feared, told me one thing. On the other hand, my teachers, whom I respected and adored, told me another thing. Something is not right. And I started to read as much as I could ferociously any book that I could find about that topic in English, French, German. And the more I read, the more I did sinking feeling my father was involved. So how to find out? Asking him. Problem was he wouldn't talk. But I knew my father was a raging alcoholic. And as a child of an alcoholic parent, I knew that there are three phases in the day. Phase one, you're looking for a drink, is restless, irritable, and discontent. Phase three, he's in La La Land drunk. But phase two, I call it nowadays the shicker zone. It's, I make it up. You could approach him. You can manipulate him. You can get money out of him. And I used that phase two, this shicker zone phase, to ask him questions. And the questions and the answers I want to structure in three, in three topics. First of all, when I asked him about what happened, he told me, look, Bernd, what allegedly happened in the East, he already told me. There's already told me that there's something happened. We, the Wehrmacht, didn't do anything. It was all the SS. And that was a lie. Because I learned it from the lady upstairs, Nina von Stauffenberg. How did I know it? Because when she had grandchildren on Sundays, they came to visit her. And my parents slept after lunch, and I didn't. And when I heard the grandchildren in the hallway, I sneaked up to play with them. And I knew in this apartment, literally for multiple visits, as a refuge, a beautiful place, and the walls covered with pictures of her and her husband, a happy, happy, lucky family and living together. He was a good person. And he knew about what happened. And she told me that he knew about what happened. Everybody, officer, had to know. And my father said he didn't. Well, 20 years after his death, when the archives in the East opened, I got a picture mailed by a researcher. My father sitting next to Heinrich Himmler in 1942 as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, and if the head of the beast, the SS, Heinrich Himmler, talks to a German officer, it was not about tank tactics. It was about securing territories for mass murder. Then my father lied to me. The second phase of answers or questions that I raised, he said, look, Bernd, when civilians were killed, they don't fall under the Geneva Convention. They are combatants. So we could kill them. I said, what, you want to convince me that one million children who were gassed in Auschwitz and in so many other concentration camps, their bodies burned, their ashes scattered on the killing field of Auschwitz and Birkenau, you tell me that they fought the mightiest army in the world? That's a bunch of horseshit. And he didn't say a word. And then finally, one day, he was completely drunk, absolutely blasted. He told me, look, Bernd, the Holocaust, you're too weak. You're too weak of a generation. You have to understand, and the world has to understand, that we did the world a favor to cleaning up this dreck, this lefluch, this schmutz, this human pile of garbage away. We did the world something good, and now they call us murderers. But that was the final straw that broke the camel's back of trust I had with my father. I turned away from him. I wanted to know the truth. And I asked my teacher, how do I find out about the truth? I feel guilty. He said, well, the only way that you can feel, that you can do what I do, he was a former Jesuit priest, become a priest, and I didn't want him to become a priest. But as a, as a Catholic, faithful Catholic, you need to make amends to those who are harmed. You mean the Jews? I answered, yes. I don't know any Jews. He said, well, I can arrange that. We belong to the progressive wing of the Catholic Church. We, in once a year, we're inviting uh, Jews and, and uh, Arabs from Israel to Germany. And in a seminar, we always invite German, one or two German participants that all learn to deal with each other and learn from each other to practice peace. And I joined one of these groups. And I must say, I was impressed, not only by the groups, but about the Israeli girls. 
And uh, Tachalis uh, befriended one of them, and she said she was very down to earth, and she said, look, Pern, if you want to see me again, you have to come to Israel. Tachalis, do you want to? I said, that was a big Schwitzer. I said, absolutely, I'd do that. The problem is I had no money, no, no, no ticket, no plane, no nothing, no passport. All that I gained back, gained within do summer jobs in the following two months. And I hitchhiked to Munich, I don't recommend that. Took a train from Munich over the Alps to the port city of Ancona in Italy. It, uh, purchased a ticket on a, on a ferry. Um, it's not a cruise, I slept on deck. In Piraeus we re reprovisioned and uh, I sent a telex that was before Google Schmuggle and all the good stuff. Sent a telex to Tel Aviv, or Haifa, that I, would re that I would arrive this and this day and this and this time with that and that ferry. And we arrived in Haifa, I remember the arrival. The, suddenly the mountains, the Carmel Mountains you see in the distance, people were standing there early in the morning, morning prayer with the filament. So when we arrived, I stepped foot on the ground of the state of Israel, and I was petrified. What if somebody would recognize my name? Maybe my father did something. It was fear. On the other hand, I saw her standing outside the customs area, and everything, the doubt and fear was wiped away. She embraced me and said, let me, go to, let me take you to my parents' house. And her parents lived in Evershanan, and it was a neighborhood, a working-class neighborhood in the Carmel Mountain, Evershanan. And when the taxi arrived, and Shirut arrived, uh, the parents were outside. Her father, chit-chatting in Yiddish, I had no idea what he was talking about, took my rucksack and her mother took my bag, and they, kept, and they literally forced me into the house in a loving, caring fashion, told me I should stay there, and they opened a room, prepared a room just for myself, and the others slept in one room, it was a one-room apartment. And in the evening, they prepared food, falafel, trommos, trina, and chit-chatting with me, and I had no idea what they were talking about except when my friend interpreted. And her father wanted to speak with me. And he looked at me and said, do you feel comfortable to speak German? Because I don't. But for you, I'm making an exception. He said, how did you learn German? He looked at me, then he showed me the arm, rolled up the sleeve and the number tattoo, and said, ich war in Lagern. I was in the camps, plural. So here I was for the first time in Israel, in the Jewish homeland, in a Jewish family home, in a home of Holocaust survivors. I felt like sinking into the ground. What do I do? I was afraid. And he said, don't be afraid, Bernd. I just want to know, do you know everything what happened? And I answered him, no. So a few days later, he took me to Yad Vashem. He took me up from work. There was a foreman in the port of Haifa, a very burly, strong man. He took me to Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim and took me by, physically by my hand and walked to the ex exhibit, the old exhibit. And in the end, or in between, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it anymore. I was emotionally distraught, I was crying. And he held me in his arm and asked myself, how these people, in a positive sense, who rebuild their personal lives, their professional lives, their families, rebuilding an old country anew, there's something unique about them, I want to learn. And on the way back to Germany, I decided I want to learn about Jews. Well, where can you learn about Jews? Well, you go to the library, but that's not what I wanted to do. I read enough about that. I approached the Jewish community in my, home, in my city, which is unique because of only about 30,000 Jews, 25,000 Jews left at the time, mostly in communities in Frankfurt, Berlin, Munich, and in Bamberg, an old town with a long history of Jewish, well, Jews were part, of the, part and parcel of the fabric of this town. There was a small community of Holocaust survivors. And the same door that I saw as a, as a child, this glass door, and this same door with, above with a golden star, at that door I knocked as a young man, and a man opened, his name was Itzhak Rosenberg, the chair of the Jewish community, who was a tiny little man, looked it up to me and, and asked me, was machst du, was willst du, what do you want? And I must rambled my story quickly through and he looked at me and said, come in. We walked through a hallway, it was very dark, there was one light in the corner, red light, and I asked him, I said, what is these black plates with the names? Because the all walls were covered black, literally all over, including the ceiling with black granite planes with names engraved. And he told me, each name is one death. And there were about 1,200 Jews from Bamberg, never came back from Teresa's stuff. That's the last memory, and the red light is near Tamit, eternal light. He guided me in his office, the curtain was closed, windows drawn, it was hot, there was no air conditioning, there was no fan. He took off his, his, his jacket, it was very pale, and the number tattooed on his forearm stood out. And uh, I don't have to ask him what that meant. 
And he looked at me, yeah, this is Auschwitz. My name is Itzhak Rosenberg. I survived Auschwitz. What do you want? Very hard, tough man. And I told him my story. He said, that's a sad story. What do you want? I said, I want to learn. Well, I could take a few books, go home. No, I want to learn with you. Maybe you can teach me. He looked at me, teaching you. You know, when you teach somebody, you get money. Do you have money? I said, no. Well, then you need to give me something in return. What can I give you in return? He said, well, you will be our Shabbos Goy. And in return, I will teach you. I had no idea what Shabbos Goy, Shabbos Shmoy meant, but it seemed to be like a good deal. I said, when do I come? Well, this Friday at six o'clock. I was there on Friday, six o'clock. It was dark. Seven o'clock, 7.30, he showed up and said, why did you come at six? He said, you told me. He said, six, 5.30, seven. It's different time zone. So just learn it. Un Un-Germanize yourself. It was difficult. And he showed me the kitchen and the tables, what I needed to set up. as a couch up his score, what he needed to clean up. And he told me one word, do not talk to the, to the minions. And told him, talk to the alta cockers. That's what he said. Just be quiet. They won't like you. Don't worry. And indeed, when they came, they were hickering and pickering because it was the small little world that they had. And, uh, and it like said, look, I told you, don't worry. I take care of it. And so Friday, Friday, every Friday, every Saturday, week by week, month by month, holiday by holiday, I acted and I worked as a Shabbos boy. And the closer I came to this community of choice, the more I distanced myself from the community of origin. I absorbed literally the liturgy, the language, the mannerism. And um, my parents found out there were many nasty encounters, but one encounter was bad. When Christmas fell on a Friday night, and Christmas Eve in an Orthodox Catholic family home, I can play it in my mind like a movie. With my mother, we went to the, to the Holy Mass in the, in the evening in a church, the cathedral, coming back to eat the lentil soup and uh, a carp. It was a symbolic food for Catholics for Christmas. Then we were waiting for my father ringing the bell where he was in the, from the, when he opened the big door to the large living, living room, standing next to the beautiful Christmas tree with candles. And he was in his darkest fine suit with a knight's cross around his neck singing festive Christmas hymns. And I was not there. And when I came home Saturday evening, all hell broke loose. And I said, look, let's stop this Greek tragedy. I tell you one thing, I will not come to any Christmas anymore when you have this nasty cross of the blood spe speckled cross. This is blood stained, your murder. You, I cannot sit with a murder on the same table. He looked at me, raus, get out. But it was a little problem. Ain't Kessif, no money, story of my life. Right? And uh, I, I was in second to last year in medical school. I had a scholarship, but I needed some pocket money. And I never took money from the community. And Itzak must have known that something bad happened and told the community, and specifically one member who never talked to me, his name was Aaron. And Aaron was a unique man. He, Itzak told me, we only know that he was in Auschwitz. His family dis disappeared. It's written in the Red Cross documentation, but he never talks about it. And Aaron looked, looked, literally walked towards me on a Saturday in the community between the prayers and said, do we stay goy? Yes, I am the goy. If I have five years here, by the way. Oh yeah, dein name is Bernd, your name is Bernd, yes. Deine Schuhe and deine Schmutze sind, uh, the shoes sind schmutzig, your shoes and your shirt are dirty. Kauf, kauf neue Sachen, gave me 100 marks. So he insulted me and gave me 100 mark. I walked over to Itzhak, he was in office, he said, Itzhak. Aaron gave me 100 mark and then he told me, then he insulted me. He took a look at me, he said, you got 100 mark from Aaron? Well, did you use the opportunity to ask for 200? I said, no, because you're going. What does it mean? I said, he laughed at a wicked humor, said, sit down. One thing you didn't understand yet, that none of us had emotions left after the war. We had to rebuild them. I rebuilt it with my new wife, a non-Jew. She became Jewish, we had a Jewish child, and I lived a happy life. Aaron doesn't talk about it. And whatever reason, Aaron started to talk with me in the last six months of his life about what happened to him. And it's too gruesome to repeat it, but he was a member of the Sunder Commando. Jews who were guiding other Jews to the ovens. To the first to un undress them, give them the number and said, on the other side, you pick up the number and get your clothing back. The, the ultimate form of, of abuse. When the doors closed of the gas chambers, Cyclone B were thrown in, in the chambers. When the screaming and crying stopped after five, ten long minutes, they came in with gas masks, the Sonder Commander, put, pulled out the gold teeth, put the bodies on the, the oven, crushed the bones and scattered the remnants on the killing fields of Auschwitz. And Aaron survived. After 90 days, the, crew, and the first unit was killed and then the next unit came in. And Aaron survived. 
He was crying like a child and probably his last opportunity to talk to me. Six months later, he was dead. I was asked to come to, to help them for the, for the Chebe Kadisha. And I told it's like, I am not a Jew. You're one of us, it's like, you help us. I helped them. And the day after we buried, in the early morning, we buried it's like, uh, Aaron, it's like, gave me the prayer book and said, say the Kaddish. And I said the Kaddish for my friend. And then I crossed the line. That was the crossover. And I knew there is no way back. I identified myself with the religion and the, the, the group. I'm recognized by them. I said, it's like I want to become a Jew. It's like looked at me, showed me the number and said, this is a bad idea. But I knew this question would come one day. So I prepared myself. I will send you to a rabbi in Frankfurt who will talk you out of it. And I paid train, hotel, food, whatever you want. But don't come back with the Fetreta coffee, the, with, the, with the story that I had in my head. And um, the rabbi received me, and we have a long conversation. He, honored, he said, I'm honored to teach you, but no conversion. Every time I met him, I asked for conversion because it was a nutmeg. And he said, no, until the summer and the spring of 1986. He said, look, Bernd, I will refer your case to the rabbinical court. We'll meet in December this year. Until you get there, and you know way that, that they guarantee that they pass, that you pass, you have to do a little plastic surgery. I don't want to talk about it. It was not a nose job. Had to be done in an orthodox facility in, in Switzerland, in Basel. Two months later, I had to undergo an, a mikve, an immersion in a mikve in an orthodox Hasidic community in Metz. And in December 1987, in December 1986, I underwent a halachic conversion in Germany. And I remember it was like a trial. The judges were the rabbis in dark robes with dark heads on, like judges in a Supreme Court. And I was asked many questions, and the chief justice judge looked at me and said, the chief rabbi, I don't understand one, one thing. You need to convince me, otherwise you will not convert you. Why would a German become a Jew when there's no necessity? And I told him why. And he returned, they retreated, returned to the entire group. I had to stand up and the rabbi read me the Teodat Gyu, the conversion certificate in, English, in German and then in, in Hebrew. And he asked me, do you understand? Yes. What do you want to do? Your name, you want to change your name. Your name is Ben Avraham, not your first name. What is your first name? I was stunned, I didn't know I said burn is your first name, but you know what it means? The bear slayer. You dove, dubi, dove ben Abraham, muzzle tov. That's you will become a Jew now, but join the crowd. It was a very well twisted humor too. And then he asked me the question, what do you want to do now? I said, I will emigrate to Israel, work as a doctor and fight in the army to give something back what was taken from them. I will be prepared to give my life. And so I asked for the Jewish community to send me a letter to the Israeli uh, consulate and its Israeli embassy in Bonn. I was approved in the Sochnot, the Jewish agency in Frankfurt approved me too. Within a month, I had a stamp in my passport at a Molei Chadash and a one-way ticket from Frankfurt to Berlin. I took a, Frankfurt to Tel Aviv. I took a El Al plane. The night before, I said goodbye to Itzhak and Itzhak urged me to say goodbye to my parents. My mother was crying when she saw me come approaching the house, my father yelling and screaming that I should not enter the house, I'm a traitor. And I left and I arrived in Israel the next day, started my life in a kibbutz, learned Hebrew, cultivated bananas. If you have any questions about banana, I can answer them. And um, then was sent to a, a hospital in downtown, it called, was called Ichilov, it's now the Elias Soraski Medical Center. Did one year of uh, stage or internship to get my German license up to Israeli park. One month later, I was drafted into the Israeli army, um, made basic training officers course, and it was the first month of the first intifada. And I was dip- dispatched with a f- com- in a combat unit to Beit El uh, in nearby Ramallah, in the West Bank, the occupied territories, war zone. And the commanding officer was standing there with a group of 36 soldiers, young soldiers, and me, and said, this is your chevre, this is your doctor. His name is, you have to change that name. Um, is Dr. Dov. And uh, I was standing there in the uniform, I was a lieutenant, and I asked myself, if they find out that I'm a Nazi, son of a Nazi in drag, they will kick me out of here. They will kill me. And I decided not to talk about my life to anybody, which I did. That was a bad idea. I, I tried throwing my life in this virtual closet, slamming the door shut, throwing the key away. And um, I tried, but it never... It had then an opening 
when my son, Tal, 15 years old, asked me the question, Dad, who is my grandfather? And I told him the story. And he looked at me, can I tell in school to everybody? They need to know. I said, please not. And all my children went to the Jewish schools and Orthodox schools and Talit and Philip. And I said, look, please, let, let, between us, don't talk with them about it. Well, my luck, they had a family history day three weeks later. And I was told, not that I was there, that my son raised his hand and, and proudly declared that my grandfather was a famous Nazi. Not good. And I was called to the principal's office. The principal was upset and the rabbi was there. And the principal told me, look, ask me, Dr. Walschläger, you're an esteemed member of our community. And your son Tal told us the verdrehte Geschichte that your father was a Nazi. What's wrong with Tal? There's a divorce, maybe drugs. There is nothing wrong with my son. I told him this truth. And the rabbi told, asked me, do you ever talk about it? No, come with me. And he brought me to my son's class and I had to talk. And something happened. A stone was lifted off my shoulders and I finally asked myself why I did not come back for 20 years. I have to reconnect the circle of life somewhere to move forward in a healthy way. And I took my son, we traveled a few months later to Germany. And I visited my parents in the only place I knew I could visit in the cemetery. Ironically, the cemetery that they buried, the central cemetery in Bamberg is divided into a Jewish and a Christian cemetery, just divided by a wall. And my parents' graveside, the Wolschlägers and Maury's grave, is exactly one row parallel to the wall, situated next to the wall, so that you see the gravestones on the other side, the Jewish gravestone. So I told my son, I was choking up, this is your grandparents' gravesite. This is my parents' gravesite. And the irony is they resting in the shadow of history because they never stepped out. I stepped out of the shadow. I looked back to learn what I had to learn as a German, move forward with, it, with the burning desire that we, if we cannot undo what our parents did, we need to do better and need to make good for what they did to others. And that's what I do. People ask me, how can a German become a Jew? It's my decision. I can live with that. How is it possible that a son of a Nazi becomes a normal person? It cannot be possible. It's possible. You cannot judge him, a son by the sins of his father, the Talmud says, tells us. It's not a cop-out. I'm of German, I know, but I'm different. And I actually honor my father for, the, for what he taught me. Not that he wanted to, but he taught me. He taught me a very essential lesson, that words have consequences. Words and hatred is not this amorphic black dark matter in the universe that we just have to succumb to and act out as zombies. No, we created our zombieism our, by words. Words of hatred, if left uncounted, not left responded, they fall in the fertile mind of others and they sprout into deeds. In deeds. And these deeds left unchallenged, they form habits. If these habits prevail, characters will form and adopt those habits. And if these characters outnumber others, they shape social norms. And that exclaims, and that explains definitely why so many followed the Piper, why so many killed Jews, and then they claimed they didn't do anything because it was normal. How can it be abnormal? It was the norm. Everybody did it. We killed Jews because it was normal. So from words to deeds to habits to characters to social norms, it's a very shortcut that we need as Jews need to be always aware. Not that we're living in, in fear of another anti-Semitic attack. Unfortunately, soon we have to do it again. But we need to be reconnected to our experience as Jews and the experience is to be proud as Jews, to be even sending our children to school in Israel or children to serve in Israeli army like I did, because we will not be the sheeps anymore. That is over. I once when I called somebody called me in the, in the street in my office, a dirty Jew, because my office is definitely a Jewish flavor with masuzot in every door and in the Magen David and the, the hand, the yad. And somebody said, you're a dirty Jew. I said, you know, you made two mistakes. You made an anti-Semitic remark and I am the wrong Jew for you. So you have the choice, either can leave or something bad will happen. So we have the power not only personally, but we have now a country we can go to if something bad happened. But we have to fight for our status here. We don't run away, but we need to take protective measures. Our children should grow up as proud Jews and not to be afraid of being Jews. One of my students, medical students years ago, saw the masseuse on the door and said, what is that? 
He said, you're Jewish, right? Yeah, I'm Jewish. I didn't go, I never tried, learned about it. He said, this is a misuse and inside this is, is a, paper, a paper and it's a prayer. Do you want to learn about that? I'm, of course, not a rabbi and not in any way uh, can, do, can help somebody guiding them in, in their Jewish faith. I can show them and demonstrate how it's being done. When I saw him one year later, he became a Hasid or a Chabadnik, not Hasid, a Chabadnik, and went to Chabad in Miami. And he said, thank you that you showed me that there's a pressure, in, in, a gift in each, and a treasure in each of us. It's called Judaism. Thank you. So work on the individual. Be t- instill your children the pride to be Jews. Be proud of Jews and speak up as Jews. We have a lot to give and we are not afraid. Thank you for allowing me to share. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm going to call you Dove. That's easier for me to pronounce. (laughs) Wow, incredible, incredible story. And thank you for sharing with us um, and the pride and the transformation is just just unbelievable. Um, So we're going to open an app now to, um, to... to questions. I know my brother had a f- uh, questions that I came in. Zal, you want to? Yes. Uh, thank you, Bern. And um, maybe people, people can either write in the chat that they have a question or we can uh, unmute. I don't know if you want to unmute everyone or... They're allowed to unmute themselves. They can unmute themselves. Okay. Wonderful. So the question addressed to Dr. Walschlanger is do you feel it is possible for one to come to terms with one's country and family's past without converting to Judaism? Absolutely. Um, it, for me, the solution was the conversion. That was, um, of course, a personal decision that I made. But for those, and I know quite a few in Germany, who said, look, I'm a proud German, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I don't practice my faith, and what happened in the past was horrible. I will do everything that I can to let it never happen again. Of course, absolutely. So, it's, it's, in fact, in Judaism, we say there's a concept of chassidish umos ha'olam, which means the righteous of the nations of the world. And uh, when we come to that, it, that, that topic is really that not, you don't have to be a Jew to be a good person. Anyone can be a mensch, and uh, as long as we follow the, the seven-eyed uh, mitzvahs and everything like that, so um, we are definitely on, on, on the same page. Another question that came through is, how do you respond to people who, have, who claim that they've done the math and they say it's impossible that there could be six million, such a high number that were actually killed? I don't defend people that say that. I can, I can imagine that it's even the best attempt, it's overwhelming because six million is a number. There's no, there are no pictures assigned. There's no character assigned. And what I know when I have this, this debate, I said, look, imagine there's six million sand corns in your hand. How many you need, how much do you need to fill up your hand in order to get six million? It, count them, try to count six million sand corns. It takes a lot of sand sand takes a long way in a long time when you finish and you have the experience in over six million even more so I, those who deny six million I, I don't encounter them so, so often anymore uh, they, are, they have no other occupations that they're dealing with or issues that they're dealing with but the six million it's even for not only for right-wing neo-nazis but for people denying normal people say look how do you know six million that's such a big number how can we prove that so you want to come with me to Auschwitz, I'll show you. The killing fields of Auschwitz are so vast that six million bones and ashes can be, there were only 1.2 million disappeared. Mountain of death. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's really sad looking at the past, but now looking at the future and looking at the way that the world is, is really going. This is my third and final question. Here in San Diego, we have an area called Torrey Pines Glider Port. And uh, just on tonight's news, actually, uh, a, a Jewish young lady was going there and she saw one of the gliders 
actually had a picture of a SWAT sticker um, on it. And she approached them and she, and she asked about them and they were very defensive about it, saying that that picture of, of, of the SWAT sticker is, is not, um, it, it's, it's a history, it's, it's part of history and, and it's, it's not necessarily presenting something today. So it's, it's come up a lot here in San Diego recently with what's going on. And the question that was approached was, do you think that we are experiencing today with the rise of anti-Semitism in America and the world is a foreshadow of yet another Holocaust? Another Holocaust, I don't think so. But what it happens is a growing acceptance of right-wing and neo-Nazi ideology. And let's not forget America, the United States of America is the hotbed of neo-Nazism all like the Stürmer on the website, the Stürmer here from Florida is supplying information all over the world. We have more, we in the United States have more neo-Nazis than anywhere in the world, yeah, unfortunately. Are they dangerous? Uh, yes, they're very dangerous because they have guns and they're open par parading with guns and we had several deaths already on the streets. What can we do? It will not happen in the second Holocaust because we have the state of Israel and I tell my children all the time, if push comes to shove, we Israeli citizens, we go home. But there's nobody in Germany that was not an op option. But that doesn't mean that we run away. But if it's to, if it is, there is always a place that we can call home in this middle, not Israel, Eretz Israel. We have a few questions over here. I just want to comment on what you said. Um, 100% Chasa Khalila, or there should ever be another Holocaust. But the Rebbe was once asked that question by a reporter um, if he thinks there could ever uh, be another Holocaust. And the Rebbe answered in Yiddish, Morgen in the Free, which means tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Which uh, I'm, obviously the Rebbe was saying is that um, it's something that, you, um, that can, a possibility, obviously not out of fear, but to know that uh, we have a war to fight, both spiritually and physically, that uh, and people like you and the individuals that you're doing and the message that you send is part of that um, dispelling. So um, one of the questions is, um, what did the rest of your family in Germany think of your conversion? There are two questions like that. And, and are you, and were you, and are you still in touch with any of them? Well, that's a good question. I had two sisters. One sister died in 2004, and the other lives in Bamberg. When I left Germany, I was gone. I was... My father died in 87, in, in June 19, 1st, 1987. I actually got a notification um, by a contact person in Israel who, who knew my sister. And uh, he didn't want me to come to his funeral because I'm a traitor. I should never come. I'm, he's ex -honored. I'm dishonored. I'm not carrying the name Volshek anymore. I was not allowed. And uh, I'm a traitor and uh, somebody could find me to shoot me. Um, so with my father, obviously, that didn't end well. My mother, um, he died of Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, several years later. And I saw her twice, but she was already not in, in a state that she could be approachable for a reasonable deep, deep down discussion. My older sister, Krista, died in 2004. But and unfortunately, I had the pleasure and the honor, in 2006, I had the honor and the pleasure to be with her for at least two or three times that I visited Germany in between. And my younger sister, she is three years younger, lives in Bamberg. We have a good relationship and she knows, I know her children. She knows mine. So it's quote unquote, as normal as it can be, as I can have it. Interesting. Okay. And um, another question is, what do you think of the, uh, and you kind of address this, but uh, to speak more on point, what do you think of the world unrest today and what advice uh, I'm not sure in particular what she means, maybe in the social aspect. And what advice would you give to young people today? Well, first of all, the world was always in disarray. Just the difference from the past and present is we have now this little thing here. It's called the telephone. And you can print one sentence and can launch it all over the world to 500 million people. We are more aware of what's happening in the world, but we should not forget when before we had this communication monsters. We had uh, the Khmer Rouge massacre in Cambodia, 1.3 million people massacred 
in the name of a Stone Age communism. We had Rwanda, 800,000 were butchered in a span of six, six months. We had Serbia in 1995, where hundreds of thousands of Muslim men and, men and boys were shot and murdered by Serbs. The world was always in unrest. We're just more aware about it. And we should not react, we should respond. And the beautiful thing is when, when you have a spiritual program, and I tell my, my friends, whatever spiritual program you follow, it, it should be on the basis of mutual respect. Get engaged with homeless people, get engaged with people, children that don't have enough food, participate in outreach. And I, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who actually was based in 542, Hamish Abastein, the military base and the training center for, for basic training, and the officers' training is right next to the Kfar Chabad. And uh, every time when uh, there was a holiday, they came to us and brought us food and clothing. I had a very close relationship to the Chabadnikim. So very positive. And the Rebbe is absolutely right. Mar tomorrow morning it can happen. But you, in, meanwhile, do act of goodness and demonstrate to the world that, that we can work together. It sounds like kumbaya, but we can. And the more people we can work together, more optimistic about that than fight each other just as it's so more difficult to, easier to hate than to fight. I, for example, participate in outreach projects with Muslims and um, in learning from each other. Um, I participate in, in activities in Israel and in Jewish-Arab dialogue, it is possible. And um, we need to be positive. As Jews, we have to be positive because our tradition will continue when others are long gone. 100%. Uh, coming from your from the background that you came, what would you say um, is the main cause for anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism today? There is a beautiful book. I think I have it here. A Convenient Hatred: The History of Anti-Semitism. I don't make advertising, but it's from the ADL and it's free. And uh, it is a fantastic document about where anti-Semitism ca come from. And one of the basic, basic one of the basic arguments is people were literally jealous what Jews can achieve. I mean, imagine, we are the group of people who survived 5,000 years, that we stick to our religion and identity for 5,000 years, that we, have, that we called, went back to a country where we didn't live for 2,000 years. There's a certain level of envy. And, uh, um, and there's, this is something that I see positive. It, it, they, I know what people are anti-Semites, but they always have this appreciative tone but you guys are very smart and you can achieve something. Well, we have smart and not smart people, but we can make, we can make lemon out of lemon. We can make lemon juice out of lemon. And we should not be pessimistic about anti-Semitism unless they are having guns in their hand. I have spoken with anti-Semites and actually interesting enough as I sneak myself in, um, until about five to 10 years ago, I was listed on, my, on a website about my father's elite unit, which was maintained by right-wing German activist, listed as the son of a commander. And I was invited once to a meeting in, in Germany, in Frankfurt, and I came. And I said, well, nice to meet you. They looked at my passport. You're the uh, current Bolshevik, the son of Arthur Bolshevik. Yeah. Uh, and I'm an Israeli citizen. And I'm Jewish. I laid it out to, right out to them. We actually had a conversation. We <laughs> had a conversation. It was a face-to-face -face, a conversation that was bitter, but um, we could talk. As long as you can talk, then we're on the safe side. But if the weapons are being used, we have a problem. And I'm not naive. Did you, did you ever uh, face any sort of uh, negative uh, attitude or, um, or resentment uh, when you were in Israel and when you became an Israeli, when people discovered your background? Well, let me tell you a little conversation that I had with one of my soldiers. We were stationed in Miluim, the last Miluim that I did in, in 91, in reserve duty. And we were stationed on the border, 1990, we were stationed at the border for Syria, Jordan, and uh, Israel in the slopes of the, uh, of the Golan Heights. And there was always uh, terror attacks the whole night. It was a war zone. And one of my soldiers, he looked at me and said, look, I heard your story, you told me that. Now, you were crazy enough to become a Jew. Well, granted, this is crazy. You're crazy enough to come here and be a Jew with us. That's uber crazy. But you're the one who takes a weapon and fights with us and willing to die? You're one of us. I never encountered, very, very spotty, never encountered any negativity opposite. If somebody joins the family, so he said, 
Uh, you're one of us because you demonstrated that you want to be part. You demonstrated that you put your line, life on the line and you're one of us. And most Israeli patients that I have, and they heard my story, said, you have a story that's interesting. But first of all, anachnu chevre, anachnu beachat, anachnu mishpacha. So positive, only positive experiences. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, one last question, and then uh, I guess we'll, we'll and then we'll uh, do the go to the next part. Um, are you at peace? Um, are you in, um, are you oh, hold on? Wait. Are you at peace uh, with yourself and your family uh, for what you um, have decided uh, to do in your life? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely at peace. I'm an absolute would never regret. The only thing I regret that I had to learn to make a filter fish the Polish style. That's the <laughs> only thing I ever regret. <laughs> uh, I regret one thing. And um, I spoke with a good Rebbe about that. And I spoke with my Jewish friends about that. I had never the chance to say goodbye, um, which was my choice. I'd separated from my parents without any deep conversation, explanation. That is, I cannot, I cannot undo. But what I did instead, as best as I can, to be good Jew, be a good father to two Jewish children, who are all adults now, and to live a life that is not a life of a, of a chassid, but a life of somebody who abides by the principles of the Torah, abides by the principle of the Shulchan Aruch. And um, I'm comfortable, very comfortable. I am an Israeli, I'm an American, and most importantly, I was born a German. So that's pretty much it. And the quick an 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 annotation, I, last year I was invited to speak on a German TV in a kind of a talk show. And uh, I went to the, arrived at the airport, had my Israeli passport, and he looked at me, Volschläger, uh, what you, that's a German name. I said, yeah, what are you doing here? I'm curious. He said, I'm going to be, be on this and this show. You want to be on this show? Hey guys, they're going to be on this and this show. Let's, let's view it. What's your name? Uh, there's convert, conversing with people, interacting with people is the antidote to hatred. 100%. So, uh, Dov, is um, for people who want to um, find out more, I, I believe you wrote a book? Yes, I did. So, you, you want to just give any more information about that if people are interested? On Amazon. On Amazon, there's, I'm, I'm not on a book tour, I did it for 15 years. Uh, Amazon, a Google, a, a German Life, A German Life, and you come across uh, my book, and I'm happy to sign it when you want to do it. Beautiful. Also, also the audio version is available on Kindle. Beautiful. Your story is incredible, and thank you for the work that you do and the message that you share. Um, are we going to, Zal, you just want to say some final remarks before we end? Yes, Bern, thank you so much for sharing your story and from actually reading your book and, uh, and getting into it, the, the details of your story that, that they, I would really suggest that if uh, people want to be inspired to actually continue the inspiration and, and read the book, you put things down in a beautiful way and uh, really speak to the neshama, the soul of the people. And that's what we want to end off the program with tonight. The Labavitcher Rebbe uh, has, has basically spoken to the younger generation. People want to know about anti-Semitism, what it is today. Well, it's about changing the, 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 uh, changing the philosophies, changing our uh, prisms, changing the way that we are uh, going and changing it for the better, changing it for the good. And uh, so there's a, a famous two words that we like to focus on, especially now during the pandemic of COVID, is positivity bias, is to have a positive bias outlook to everything. Today in San Diego, we're so fortunate that we started school, uh, in-person schools. The school opened up Chabad Hebrew Academy. Our kids went to school and the, the energy and, and the beauty of kids going back to school after being away from each other for six months, well, it, well, you could feel it in the air. 
Um, even though we weren't even allowed to leave our car when we dropped off the kids and they were isolated. It was so much safety measures. But it's unbelievable the positivity in the face of what is going on. And that's what the Lubavitcher Rebbe did. So just for the high holidays and uh, uh, mentioning that Chabad of Toluca Lake and Chabad of downtown are having uh, high holiday services, obviously toned down, not like they usually are. So um, register today. Go on the website and register. You'll see the entire schedule, what you're able to come to, what you're comfortable with coming to, how you feel safest coming to the uh, celebrations. And even if you're going to be home to usher in the new year with a Shana Tova, a good year, and we give you a bracha that you should all be Ksiva V'chasima Teva, written and sealed for a great year. Beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi Zalman. Before we end, I'm, I do want to play... Um, one song on tonight's theme, but um, just to before we end, I just want to show you the upcoming programs that both uh, my brother and myself have. Like he spoke about the high holidays uh, season that um, we have you covered, Chabad has you covered, and uh, the high holidays uh, both at um, Chabad of Toluca Lake and Chabad of downtown as well as um, we have chauffeur uh, soundings in the park. Um, and prior to the high holidays, uh, Chabad in San Diego is putting on um, a show of Dudu Fisher, the famous Dudu Fisher, and, um, and as well as Thursday night before the high holidays, I'll be giving online a pre-high holiday sermon and going over parts of the prayers uh, beautiful uh, pieces uh, for you to um, um, uh, to enjoy and to learn about before we start the high holidays and be in touch with us um, for further events which we have planned. So tonight's theme is about a new holiday, a new you, um, a new change. And that's the idea of Teshuvah. And I want to make mention that Teshuvah as beautifully uh, seen tonight is not an aspect of change to change yourself uh, or transformation. Dov, Dr. Byrne, you had a Jewish neshama all along and that's what was brought out in your conversion and the truth is Teshuva is the aspect of returning, returning to that deep in part of us, that godly soul, that godly part of us. There's a beautiful, there's a beautiful poem uh, written by the one of the first chief rabbis of Israel. I, I printed it out over here. You could see the poem says, Singer of Teshuva, are you yet born? If your soul is still bound in the bond of heaven, the bond of life, descend to us soon. Play your harp. Let the downhearted hear. Let the delusioned listen to the murmur of your strings and be revived. So tonight was about bringing, returning to that part with us. So we're going to end with this. This, sorry. <laughs> Shore, <laughs> 
שמה נשמעתך בצרור so much everyone uh za i don't have that video if you want to show it you know okay so thank you all for joining and dov thank you so much that was really amazing amazing um and uh we want to wish everyone a shana tova masuka that we should all find within ourselves the ability to um to make good changes in our life and to Please, God, will be prepared when we come to the Rosh Hashanah that not only will we meet the new year with our new selves, but we'll meet the new year with Mashiach Tzadkainu together with every, all our brothers in Jerusalem where there'll be no more of this COVID Mashiach and no more of hate uh, or anything like that, but with Mashiach Tzadkainu. Thank Amen. You. Just like to say thank you to our sponsors of the evening and for people who made donations in honor of the month of Elo and coming up to the high holidays. So thank you very much. And welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining.
שנה טובה. שנה טובה. Thank you. שנה טובה. שנה טובה. Thank you, Rabbi. שנה טובה. שנה טובה. All the best. Rabbi, that was yes. phenomenal. Um, oh, I'm, this I'm, is Nesta. I was thinking the, uh, um, there was another Nesta that I know. I, <laughs> I know. I would love to have him speak to our Rotary Club. We, have, we do our Zoom meetings at Rotary. We're the fifth largest Rotary in the world. So if you could forward to me his contact information. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, We've had several You know my brother? Like, like a father, like a brother. Okay, so I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it to my brother and he'll send it to you. I appreciate it. No Such problem. a nice family. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was yeah, a phenomenal, it was, one of the best Zoom that I've ever been on. Thank you. It was incredible. It was quite amazing. How far is Toluca Lake from here? It's right, it's in Los Angeles, right by Universal Studios. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. You too. Take and uh, Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Where was he at? Was he in Israel or was he He's in, in Miami. He's in Florida. Miami. Good. He's a doctor in Florida. Good. Actually, I wanted to ask him what kind of uh, medicine he practiced, but he's a doctor in Florida. Good. That was as good as it gets. Yeah, please forward that to me because I'm going to present it. I've already mentioned to them I want to do this. So, all okay. right. All right. Thank you. All the best. You too. Bye. Thank you, Shana Tova. Shana Tova.